Okay. Good afternoon, and welcome to the League of Women Voters debate on Measure D for the November 5, 2013 election. I am Mary Alice Thornton, president of the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto. The League is a nonpartisan political organization whose mission is to encourage informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League does not support or endorse candidates or parties, although it does work to influence public policy through advocacy and education. This debate, funded by the League of Women Voters Education Fund through contributions from community donors and members, is devoted entirely to our voter service activity, whose mission is to give information to voters so that they may make informed decisions. This debate is being filmed by the Media Center and will be aired on our cable public access channels. Watch for the schedule and live streaming on communitymediacenter.net. For more information on the election, we recommend that you visit smartvoter.org or our league website, lwvpaloalto.org. Please pick up a smart voter bookmark and the league's voters guide that contains pros and cons of Measure D on the table in the back of the room. Debaters' campaign materials are on tables outside the council chambers. In fact, I saw them outside in the beautiful open air. You are invited to stay after the debate to meet and talk with the speakers personally. And now I would like to introduce Linda Craig of the South San Mateo County League, our moderator for today's event. Thank you, Mary Ellis. This debate forum provides an opportunity to hear from the proponents and opponents for Measure D, a City of Palo Alto ballot measure in the upcoming November election. The measure is, shall the Palo Alto Municipal Code be amended to rezone the property located at 567 through 595 Maybell Avenue from R2 low density residential and RM15 multiple family residential to plan community overlay zone to include 12 single family units and 60 units of affordable senior housing. On this measure, if you favor the change in zoning, you will be voting yes. And if you want to retain the previous zoning, then you will vote no. And the debaters will give you much more information about uh, what this means uh, in their presentations. Before we begin, I'd like to go over the ground rules um, for our event. Uh, the League always has very strict rules for impartiality for all of our forums, uh, both here and throughout the nation, actually. Uh, we are scheduled to finish at 3 o'clock. And to help us keep on track, we have a timekeeper, Shirley DeMarais, who is here. You want to raise your hand, Shirley? She has a stopwatch and signs so that the presenters will be able to see when they have one minute left in their allotted time and then 30 seconds. And then when it's time to stop, I will allow the speaker to finish the sentence, but that's all. Uh, and um, I, I actually have a gavel here if it goes, gets out of hand. Um, so also, uh, we ask that the, the debaters uh, shall uh, comment on uh, items that pertain uh, to the questions that will be asked. Uh, civil and respectful behavior is expected all, at all times, both for the debaters and members in the audience. Uh, we request 
that you help maintain an atmosphere of respect and tolerance uh, throughout the forum. Each debate has each debate side has two participants, uh, the pro side and the against side. Uh, they will use no more than the total time allotted, and each team will have a total time that they will split among themselves. Um, the order of speaking has been determined by drawing numbers, and the pro side has uh, drew number one, and the con side drew number two. Drew number two. They will speak in the reverse on the closing statements. Uh, the league has provided tables outside the forum room for campaign materials. No campaign materials are permitted inside the forum room. Uh, again, uh, I will be enforcing the strictly enforcing the time limits for the speakers. Electronic devices and recording, you've already been requested to either mute or turn off your cell phones. Uh, we are videotaping this um, event, this debate, for broadcast on the Mid Peninsula, Mid Peninsula Media, uh, Community Media Center uh, local cable. Uh, the debaters have agreed to use, uh, the use of this vid video is only to be used in its entirety. In other words, this means we specifically f forbid the use of edited versions of the event on the internet, campaign website, social media, and YouTube. Um, following the presentations by the two uh, sides of the debate, we will be taking written questions throughout the forum. Our question collectors are uh, distributing cards and they will be uh, collecting them as we uh, proceed. Uh, we have, these are Alexandra, Elaine, Brian, and Conrad who are with us from Youth Community Service. Uh, this allows us to get a wide range of questions. Then we have question sorters here at the front uh, desk who will be grouping the questions by topic uh, during our question time. It will only be about an hour, so we will no doubt have more questions than we can possibly cover. Uh, typically, we select those that are of the most general interest or that have multiple um, questions on the same topic. We have um, Ellen Hope uh, in the red here from the South San Mateo County League and Crowning Billick from the Los Altos Mountain View League who are helping us in that regard. So we will begin with 10 minute opening statements from each side. Uh, then there will be rebuttals of five minutes each from each side. And then uh, after the questions, uh, which will be, we will allow three minutes for each team to answer, and then we will have closing statements of up to five minutes from each side, and then again will be in the reverse order. In the interest of time, and so we can keep this a nonpartisan atmosphere, we ask that there be no applause or other demonstrations of support or opposition to the debaters or the positions. At the end of the forum, we will thank the speakers with our applause. Pre and again, remind you, please silence your cell phone. So let us begin with the opening statements on the um, pro side, and you will select your first speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm Greg Scharf, and I'm the mayor of Palo Alto, and joining me is former mayor and current Pal Palo Alto Housing Corporation board member, Jean McCowan. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Palo Alto for hosting this event and the League members from other chapters on the peninsula for stepping in to moderate and provide support for this debate. So we're here to urge you to support affordable senior housing at the Mabel site and vote yes on Measure D. So what is the Mabel Affordable Senior Housing Project? It is 60 senior apartments plus 12 single family homes that will be sold to subsidize the cost of the affordable senior apartments. Palo Alto seniors who make between 21,000 and 43,000 a year will get priority for their apartments. The zoning ordinance that is before the voters will ensure that only seniors get these apartments and that the low income restriction is maintained and enforced throughout the life of the project. The senior apartment building will be four stories high. It is set well back from the street next to an existing eight story apartment building that is 100 feet high and two other apartment buildings that are mostly three stories tall. 
The Council had its first public meeting to review the project in September of 2012. Over the next nine months, the Planning and Transportation Commission and the Architectural Review Board held public meetings on the project and the Palo Alto Housing Corporation held numerous community meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings with interested neighbors. The Council unanimously approved the project after delaying its vote to allow a final round of discussions with concerned neighbors, discussions that I personally facilitated that weekend. For me personally, and I'll say this again several times, for me personally, protecting the quality of our life in our neighborhoods is one of the most important things we do here in Palo Alto. That includes maintaining the look and feel of our single family neighborhoods. So let me tell you why I voted for the Maybell Senior Housing Project. First, we need affordable housing for seniors in Palo Alto. 18% of Palo Alto residents are seniors. Many of those seniors are on fixed incomes. Right now, there are hundreds of senior citizens on waiting lists for affordable homes in Palo Alto. These are people who want to live close to their families and stay in the community where they have lived or worked for many years. According to the Council on Aging, nearly 20% of Palo Alto seniors are living near or below the poverty line. For me, that was a shocking statistic. 20% of Palo Alto seniors are living, and that's Palo Alto seniors. That's not somebody else's seniors, that's our seniors. Housing costs have doubled in the last 10 years in Palo Alto, which makes it difficult for fixed income seniors to live here. I've lived in Palo Alto for over 25 years. And I know that we are a compassionate community that cares about our senior citizens. And this project embodies those values. It is simply the right thing to do. The second reason I voted for this project is that I believe it does a better job of preserving the single family feeling of the surrounding neighborhoods than any other project that is likely to be built if this one does not go forward. A private developer building under the current zoning could construct up to 46 residences, all of which could be three or four bedroom homes. The senior housing project generates fewer car trips than a project that would be built under the current zoning. That's fewer car trips, that's less traffic. This project provides less traffic than the current zoning. The senior project will mean no driveways on Maybell where a project under current zoning would likely add lots of driveways to that street. This project will also make it safer for kids and adults by adding sidewalks where people now need to walk in the street. The senior pro project focuses on much needed housing for low income seniors who own fewer cars and make fewer trips than other populations, especially during the critical commute hours. I know the neighbors in Green Acres and Barron Park have concerns about this project. I met with them on Saturday before the council vote on the project and really listened to their fears and concerns. It became clear to me that the two main issues were these, the residents value the single family feel of their neighborhood and want to preserve it. And they have concerns about traffic. So let's talk about these issues. To address the concerns about the single family feeling of the neighborhood, the City Council required the Palo Alto Housing Corporation to change the project. We reduced the number of single family homes from 15 to 12. We had already required the homes on Maybell to have driveways in the back so that there would not be any cars exiting onto Maybell. We widened the lots on Maybell to 48 feet, which feels like a standard single family lot. My lot is 50 feet in Palo Alto. 48 feet feels like a single family house. You're going to have a single family feeling to this neighborhood when it's built. We limited the homes to two stories on Mabel and varied the setbacks to avoid a wall feeling. We left the homes on Clemo at three stories, but they're only 32 feet. And if you stand there in the park and you look at those oak trees, you can't tell me that you'll feel that it has anything but a single family feel when you look through that. These single family homes will maintain the look and feel of the single family neighborhood and provide a buffer and a transition 
between the existing single family neighborhood and the existing 100 foot tan apartments and the senior housing. It steps it back and when you're sitting on the street there, this will look like a single family neighborhood to you. So on traffic, when you look at the facts, the current project has much less impact on the neighborhood than any other project that is likely to be built. The traffic numbers show that the senior housing project generates fewer car trips than a project built under the current zoning. Traffic experts studied the project and concluded that it would generate only nine additional trips during the critical morning commute period. Another way to compare the impact of various possible projects is to look at the number of bedrooms each would create. Experts say this is one of the best ways to understand how many people move in and how much they are likely to drive. The affordable senior project and the 12 single family homes will create a total of 103 new bedrooms. If the senior project is not built and another developer comes in and builds under the current zoning, 161 new bedrooms are likely to be added. That's 103 bedrooms for the senior housing project versus 161 under current zoning. When you consider that most of the 103 bedrooms created by the senior project will house a low income retiree living on a fairly low income, as opposed to a family with children, two jobs, you can see why the traffic experts concluded that the affordable senior housing project has much less impact on traffic, school crowding, and safety than any other alternative. To recap, I voted for this project because it is a much better alternative for the neighborhood than the existing zoning in terms of all the metrics that the neighborhoods have told me that they care about. Traffic, safety, parking, and preserving the look and feel of the single family neighborhood. In terms of density and impact, that is number of people and bedrooms and impacts on the neighborhood, this project is a far less dense alternative than the existing zoning. The senior housing project and the 12 single family homes in terms of impact on the neighborhood are in effect a down zoning of the site from the R2 and the R15 current zoning. This combined with the fact that there is a critical need for senior affordable housing in Palo Alto, and this is who we are in Palo Alto. We care about people. We care about our seniors. Seniors do best when they can stay in the community and maintain their support network. We need to protect and support our seniors as a community, and this project does that. It doesn't take a crystal ball to imagine what will happen to this land if the Palo Alto Housing Corporation is not allowed to build their senior housing project. Because of the scarcity of available land and the high price of housing in Palo Alto, the land would likely be sold to a private market rate housing developer. That developer would seek to maximize their profits and build the maximum allowable multifamily housing units. Under the current zoning, this most likely will include a combination of small lot single family and dense apartments, condos, or townhouses with three or four bedrooms occupied by families that travel to jobs, schools, and other activities that retired seniors will not. A project under the current zoning will increase traffic, impact our schools, raise safety concerns, and not preserve the look and feel of the single family neighborhood. It will also deprive 60 low income seniors the opportunity to which they have raised their children, worked, and lived. Thank you. We will now go to the speakers uh, against Measure D. Tim Gray and Bob Moss, 10 minutes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Timothy Gray. I would like to thank the people of the audience. Being here indicates that you have a deep care for the future of Palo Alto. Also, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this event so we can discuss the merits of Measure D. I am a senior housing advocate and was on the board of the Age Center Alliance with Dr. Wally Bortz and uh, Fran Ariaga in the early 90s. As a long-standing senior advocate for seniors, I am proud to represent the No on D grassroots community group and state unequivocally that the neighborhood supports affordable senior housing. Measure D is not about 
affordable senior housing. Measure D is about high density rezoning of residential neighborhoods. So how does a senior housing advocate and resident of Charleston Meadows outside the Barron Park area end up speaking for the no on D? The answer is arithmetic. My wife and I have three children that go to the neighborhood schools in the area, so I was asked to evaluate the project details. My work as a business consultant and certified public accountant requires setting aside personal biases and rendering objective evaluation. I too wondered why those neighbors had the audacity to challenge such a worthy project until I performed an independent analysis. And here's what I found. Fact, 42 senior homes can be built on the land without rezoning. Fact, only one acre of the 2.46 high density rezoning is for senior housing. Fact, most of the high density rezoning is for private market, private development of market rate housing. Fact, 60 senior rental apartments are to be built on about one acre. This is equivalent to zoning RM60 compared to projects in downtown and other high density corridors that are limited to 40 units per acre. Fact, the 60 units are planned at 6,600 square feet for a senior, senior couple. This is just slightly larger than my garage. Fact, the 60 units are stacked into a 50 foot tall building, whereas the historical limits in Palo Alto has been 30 feet. This is not senior housing, this is senior warehousing. We can, be, we can do better for our seniors. Fact, this is not a senior care facility. It is, rent, is rental housing and does not have the large communal spaces and dining rooms with meal service, yet living spaces are small, smaller than many of the true senior care facilities. Small places may be fine, but the experience of working, looking down long hallways and outside views to the back alleys of three-story pack and stack homes is not the quality of life we owe to our seniors. Fact, instead of the 2.6 acres being dedicated to seniors with ample outdoor spaces and communal space, most of the land is being upzoned to high density for the benefit of private market rate housing. Fact, private market rate rezoning allows three story homes where previously the historical limit has been two. Fact, the private market rezoning replaces these three story homes on 3,000 square foot lots, whereas regular zoning requires a minimum of 6,000 square foot lots. Fact, only 42 par parking spaces are included in the 60 units. That is 0.6 spaces per home. We know from our brothers and sisters in downtown North what happens when this kind of shortcut is taken. Remember, this is not a senior care facility. It is a senior rental housing that will attract the mobile independent seniors. Add senior service workers and visitors and families, and the parking issues will be painful to the residents and the neighbors. Fact, the parcel is in a neighborhood and far removed from services needed on a daily basis. In fact, the city-owned land on Park Boulevard would be a much better site. Fact, there are many facts that make it clear that Mabel Project was a done deal before it started. The city loaned the housing corporation millions of dollars before the uh, project was brought to the community for discussion. The city signed a, a verification of zoning three days before the council voted for that zoning. It was a done deal before the citizens were even asked. My assessment? Why would we rezone when 42 affordable senior rentals can be built with the, without the rezoning? The actions do, make, do not make sense, especially when another rezoning is being used to eliminate nearly 100 low-income re rentals in the same neighborhood at the Buena Vista Mobile Home Park. The sincerity of intent is questionable. It is plain and simple. Measure D will allow a development path that erodes the quality of life for neighborhoods and for future occupants. 
Do not be misled. The referendum is not about senior rental apartments on the Mabel site. Let's take a stand for the future that is based on wise collaboration versus dictating the solutions from the council chambers. The people have wisely planned a future that is sustainable and preserves the quality of life. It is called the comprehensive plan. Let's respect our heritage, respect our residents, respect ourselves. We cannot accept anything less. I'd like to start by giving you, uh, um, excuse, me, excuse me, those who don't know me, I'm Bob Moss, and I've been active in the community for a few decades. Um, let me start off by giving you some background on zoning and land use issues. Standard zone, like the one that most people live in, which would be, say, an R1, specifically states how large the lot must be, how tall the building can be, uh, side yard and front yard setbacks, the total square footage that can be built, all that is defined. So you know when somebody tears down the house next to you and puts a new one in, what it's going to look like. PC zoning is wildcard zoning. Anything goes. If a developer convinces the city council that what he's got is wonderful and provides some wonderful public benefits, they can get anything they want anywhere they want. And believe me, that's what the developers are coming in with because this staff and city council have been rolling over and playing dead for PC zoning. So what we have here is an unprecedented PC zone. It's the first time that single family residential area has been up zoned to PC with a density four times higher than what's allowed in the original zoning for the senior housing and three times more for the market rate housing. Also, this is the first time the Housing Corporation has put market rate houses on a BMR project. And we've been told that once this goes through, it's going to start happening all over Palo Alto because it's going to be taken as a model for how PC zoning can be dropped in anywhere they can fit it in. So this is not just talking about this project or Barron Park. This is talking about the entire city and what Palo Alto is going to look like. If you like the kind of developments that have been going in in this town in the last three or four years, then by all means, go for Measure D because you're going to get more garbage like that all over. If you want to keep Palo Alto the kind of neighborhood and community that we all treasure, low intensity, low density, safer kids to walk to school, you've got to vote against Measure D. I want to talk about some of the figures you've been given. I got my figures from an organization that a few of you have heard of. It's called the U.S. Census Bureau. They've only been getting data for about 220 years. The Census Bureau says that 7.1% of seniors, and by the way, only 17%, of 17 not 18% of people in Palo Alto are seniors. 7.1% are at or below the poverty level, not 20%. Secondly, the median income, depending on whether you take uh, the county, the, pardon me, whether you take this, the staff or you take the Census Bureau in Santa Clara County is 89000 or 73000 which means the people who are going to be living in this project will be earning between twenty-two dollars or $26,000 a year up to as much as $53,000 a year. That's not poor people we're taking care of. On the traffic, if you take a look at real traffic counts, by professional traffic engineers who have no bias, the actual traffic from this project will be over 420 trips per day. The traffic from the existing zoning will be closer to 300. So we're talking about 120 more trips per day from the project that's proposed than the existing zoning. And they're telling us it's going to be less. Not true. The same thing with bedrooms. You don't put four bedrooms homes in a 1,200 square foot unit. Thank you. Now we will return to the team speaking in favor for rebuttals, uh, beginning rebuttal arguments. Uh, five minutes total for the group. Thank you very much. I'm Jean McCown. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon in my capacity as a board member of the Palo Alto Housing Corporation. We are a homegrown, nonprofit affordable housing provider 
For the last 43 years in Palo Alto, owning and managing many hundreds of residences for families and seniors. No doubt uh, many of you are or know as friends and neighbors those who live in Palo Alto Housing Corporation residents spread throughout our community. Thank you all for being here to listen to this debate. In response to the Measure D opponent's arguments, I'd like to cover a couple of points. First, the claim that uh, neighborhood concerns were not taken into consideration as this project went through the public process. That's not the case. Before any proposal at all was developed, the Palo Alto Housing Corporation initiated community meetings in the neighborhood to hear from residents, listen to their input, and answer questions. Three meetings like this were hosted by the Palo Alto Housing Corporation over the nine months as the project moved through the city consideration process. Our staff also had numerous one-on-one -on -one meetings and conversations with neighbors to listen and address their concerns. Since last September, over nine months of public discussions took place before the final city council action in June. It, it was re reviewed numerous times by the city council, the Planning and Transportation Commission, the Architectural Review Board, and public comments were encouraged and accepted at every step. As the mayor mentioned, he conducted 10 hours of weekend meetings with Palo Alto Housing Corporation representatives, I was one of them, and neighborhood leaders, many of whom are here today, to further understand the key issues and concerns. And this led to changes in the project, substantive changes, reducing the number of market rate homes, and imposing numerous site and architectural changes to further address traffic, safety, and aesthetic concerns while still maintaining a financially viable project. Second, the claim that the project is too dense or that the location is not a good place for senior housing or, and that increased traffic will put school children at risk. The senior building will be located next to two existing apartment complexes, the eight-story TAN apartments that has 61 units and the Rassador Park apartments with 66 affordable family units in predominantly three-story buildings. So there, there will be an additional 60-unit building next door to two other buildings, greater in height in one case, but no more in units. The senior apartments are going to be placed in the interior of the property close to these two larger buildings, um, set back more than 100 feet from the edges of the property on Maybell and Climo. The individual homes to be built on Maybell will have no driveways onto Maybell, and they have design requirements to make them compatible with the single family character on Maybell. Limited to two, <coughs> limited to two stories, 20 foot setbacks, which is what's required in R1 zoning. And again, it's not a single building, it's individual single-family homes. On Climo, across from the city park, all of those mature oak trees will be preserved to screen the view of the new single-family homes. The area is very well served by public transportation. The 22 bus, number 22 on El Camino, comes by every 12 minutes. On, on the current schedule, connects to shopping areas and service areas up and down between Palo Alto and Mountain View. This confirms why a senior community works very well at this site, especially for seniors without cars. And we will be providing a dedicated shuttle van as well. In contrast, as the mayor pointed out, a private developer would likely construct 34 to 46 residences using the current multifamily and duplex zoning. And I have to correct Mr. Moss, this site is not zoned single family. It's zoned multifamily. It doesn't take much common sense to recognize that 34 or 46 families in three to four bedroom homes will generate more traffic and more impacts than 60 senior affordable units. Finally, the opponents claim we could build 41, or I heard 42 today, um, affordable homes under the existing zoning. This is simply not the case. You cannot achieve the affordability level we are sh shooting for here at very low income at such a low density. So again, a yes vote on this measure will allow us to proceed with this 60 unit apartments for low income seniors. A no vote will lose that opportunity and likely result in a market rate development with far greater impacts on the neighborhood. Thank you. And now the rebuttal from the team against um, Measure D. Uh, five minutes total. Um, let me give you a few more clarifications on uh, reality versus claims. The uh, 
the statement that traffic is going to be less keeps popping up and popping up. The model that the Housing Corporation and the city staff used was called the VTA 208 model and was based on data from 1995 and 1999, and it predicts that senior housing will generate 2.2 trips per day. And we complained about that. We had a traffic consultant who said, that's ridiculous. You should be using the current model, which is the 2012 model, which they finally agreed to do after they had approved the project. That says 3.5 trips per day. And then we looked at the study that was done by a traffic engineer who knows nothing about Palo Alto or had any relationship with us. And he found the actual trip in senior projects at the low end was 4.5 and at the high end was six trips per day. So I took the 4.5 to get the figure. Second, when they talk about traffic added during the rush hour, they're ignoring the eight additional single family homes. Those homes alone will increase rush hour traffic significantly. So we are going to have a problem with the safe routes to school uh, area. Another thing, when they did their traffic study, they ignored pedestrians and bikes, which is not the way things are normally done. So they came up with the figures on how wonderful the traffic was going to be. It is not going to be wonderful. Second, the PC ordinance explicitly says when a PC is adopted, you should behave in consistency with the comprehensive plan. This PC violates the comprehensive plan repeatedly. For example, there's a comprehensive plan elements on housing. L3, maintain Palo Alto's residential neighborhoods while sustaining the variability of its commercial areas. Use the zoning ordinance to enhance Palo Alto's desirable qualities. L5, maintain the scale and character of the city. Putting a 50-foot tall building where 30-foot tall buildings are supposed to be next to 30-foot tall single-family homes does not maintain the scale. L6, avoid abrupt changes in scale and density between residential areas and between areas of different densities. 60 units next to R1 at six units, that's not maintaining the density transition. L7, evaluate changes in land use in the context of regional levels and overall city welfare and objectives, as well as the desires of the surrounding neighborhoods. Larry Klein said that in his time, all my years on the council, I've never experienced such virulent opposition and a certain amount of stalling by the applicant. And in today's post, you can get another example of stalling by the applicant. They were asked to provide their 460 form, which says how much people contributed, and they refused. We've had this problem with the housing corporation from day one. They bought the land in, in June last year. They had a study session in September at which they said, we're going to have to upzone this to RM40 or PC. And immediately in November, before there were any public discussions or any hearings, the city council let the planning commission, let the housing corporation $5.8 million of public money to proceed with the project. And he said, oh, we're not making any commitment that we're going to give you the PC. Do you all believe that? Raise your hand if you do. I've got a bridge I want to sell you. Before there were any public hearings, before the public was formally informed, the council and the housing corporation had gotten under the table and agreed what this project was going to be. And we have talked to them repeatedly, and the housing corporation has refused to make any modifications in the project. The few modifications that were imposed were done by the city council as a result of unprecedented complaints by the community. The, if you look at the stack of emails, it's two and a half inches thick of people complaining about this project. If this goes through, we're going to have a very significant change in the environment in Palo Alto and the way that we can depend on zoning in residential neighborhoods. I urge you to vote against Measure D and save Palo Alto's environment and maintain our quality of life. Thank you. Now we will proceed with questions from the audience. 
Um, we have three minutes each, a limit for each team in response, and if they take less time, we will have time for more questions. Uh, but each side will have an opportunity to respond to each question. The first, uh, the first question is, and this will be uh, answered by the team in favor, it is, it has been said that if the ordinance is not approved by the residents of Palo Alto, that the development on Maybell site could be much worse for the neighborhood. Please explain your conclusion. Yes, that's actually why I voted for the project. It will be much, much worse for the neighborhood. I don't think there's any question in my mind about that. You will have more traffic, more safety concerns, more parking concerns, you will simply have more people on that spot. And so all of the issues that the neighborhood has will be made worse. It will not feel like a single family neighborhood. You will get small lot type single family out there or dense condos. It'll feel more like a wall. What the city council did here was make sure that this looks and feels like a single family neighborhood when this is done. The, um, the senior project is set way back near the Tan Apartments, which is 100 feet high. And the, what are the apartments called next to it? Arrastadero Park. And the Arrastadero Park Apartments, which is predominantly three stories. And then you're now surrounded this by single family. The neighborhood will look fine. It'll look like a single family neighborhood when this is done. I don't know if you want to add anything, Gene. No, I just. I think the audience appreciates us being confined to three minutes since you usually have to limit your comments to the council when you speak to three minutes. It's a good challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then the team uh, speaking against the measure, Do you, uh, the question again is, it has been said that if the ordinance is not approved by the residents of Palo Alto that development on the Maybell site could be much worse for the neighborhood. Perhaps you'd like to comment on that. Three minutes. The scenario that um, is being used to scare people into, as stated as the alternative, is simply not true. And we can't get into all the details here. Mo the most likely configuration is about 15 uh, homes. And we must remember that the 10 uh, apartments are an eight story building that can't be used as a precedent because that was. A, something that came, what came in our history and then the council had a revolution and, and people were kicked out and they said, no, this isn't the, the Palo Alto we want. So you're holding up as a representation of something normal as something that, that this, our collective history has rejected. Yeah, the, uh, the usual claim is that it's gonna have a lot more density in people. But the RM15 zone, which was put in more than 35 years ago, was done specifically to give a gradual transition between the single family and higher density along Arrested Arrow. And if you look at the allowable size of the building that can be built on that site, and you can build out the maximum number of apartments, the average size of the apartment would be about 1,200 square feet, 100 square feet of which is supposed to be open space that isn't lived in. So the actual unit, and it doesn't take into account things like hallways, stairs, and so on. The actual size, if you really densify it, would be about 1,000 square feet. That's a one or two bedroom apartment. So it's not that much bigger than the uh, number of bedrooms in the senior development, and there's far fewer units. Also, you don't have the additional eight single-family homes, which will be four bedrooms. So the total amount of traffic and the total amount of impact on the neighborhood building with the existing zoning is less, not more. Another thing that people ignore is that every housing unit costs the city at least two thousand multifamily at least two thousand dollars more a year for services than we collect in taxes. Senior housing costs more because the, because the seniors need more services, paramedics, for example. So you can figure that senior housing is going to cost the city about $22 to $2,500 per unit per year net. And the multifamily 
is going to cost closer to 1800 So if you just talk about impact on the city's budget, the project they're proposing is much more expensive to the taxpayers than the one that would build, be built under standard zoning. The standard zoning was put in there for a reason. It gives a good transition to the neighborhood and it will be consistent in appearance, density, traffic, and bedrooms. And that's what we should keep. Thank you. Now we'll begin with the team uh, against Measure D for the next question. This is, uh, the question is actually addressed to you. Exactly what development will you accept on this site? And again, it's three minutes. Why don't you start? <laughs> Senior housing would be perfect. And the, the zoning does allow, I believe, up to 42 units. Now, the claim that, that you have to parcel out off these 3,000 square foot lots uh, around it and, and auction them off to private developers uh, to fund this is only because you're not willing to go to the balance sheet and find alternative funding. Uh, if the city were to put up as much money as they had in some of the downtown projects on a per unit basis, it would have a completely different financial model. So the fact that, or the representation that this has to be done and it can only be done this way is simply not true. And the neighborhood would welcome a really uh, a win-win discussion. There is a path to a project that would make the residents better off and the neighborhood better off. One, one of the problems that this uh, novel way of funding BMR developments brings up is the Housing Corporation is saying we can't get money unless we densify the neighborhood and put in all of these single family units, something that's never been done before. So what we're being told is that how Palo Alto develops and how Palo Alto looks is going to be depending in the future on who has the money, what outsiders are willing to pay, what outsiders want Palo Alto to look like. Now, do you want the definition of Palo Alto to depend on who's got the bucks, on who's influencing the housing corporation and the city council by saying, we'll pay for this intensification and we don't care about the comprehensive plan or zoning or, or consistency with the community. Uh, this is where we think the money is. If that's the way we want to go forward, we're in real trouble because we're going to be run by the one percent or the one tenth percent, not by the neighborhood, not by the community, not by the people of Palo Alto. That's not the way I want to see this city done. I hope that's not the way you want to see it done. Thank you. Uh, the team in favor of Measure D has an opportunity to respond as to uh, the development on the site. Thank you. I'll, I'll add to this discussion. The, um, we're hearing a lot of different numbers being thrown around here. Um, we, heard, we just heard maybe it's 15 houses, but then we also heard you could build 41 senior units. I mean, there's a lot of, of confusing f facts and figures there. The source of the information that the mayor referred to and that I referred to of what can happen under the existing zoning is the analysis that was done by the city planning department uh, very carefully. It was actually presented to the neighbors again in the, in the meeting that we had over the weekend and presented to the city council and discussed in the city council meeting. So the source of the information that we're relying on, that there's this range between somewhere between 34 and 46 units is based on the information that the planning department developed and they are the ones who administer these zones in the city. The, uh, the, the R2 duplex zone, which would allow four duplexes, that's eight houses, and the RM15 zone. So that's, that's the source that we're relying on um, for, the under, for the information about what could happen on this property in the event this project does not go forward. And I'd just like to add briefly that Mr. Moss throws out a lot of facts and figures that just aren't accurate. That what you really need to do is to go on the city's website and look at the frequently asked questions where the city planning department, who's analyzed the site and who frankly would be in charge of approving the project and what goes forward there under the existing zoning. And they lay out all of this. They lay out the traffic studies. They lay out what's allowed on the site, how many units you would get. Those facts shouldn't be in dispute. And 
you know, I, I would really like it if we focused on the actual facts on this. Thank you. Now, the next question is for the team in favor, Measure D. This is, how can it be guaranteed that only seniors will live in the proposed development, only Palo Alto seniors, only low-income seniors? Uh, three minutes. Yes, well, the, um, there's, two, there's two methods. One is the, uh, the funding that the city provided r requires that it be very low-income senior affordable housing for at least 55 years. The zoning provides that as well. The age, you can be, the age limit is, it has to be at least 62 years old. And again, it has to be maintained in this affordable housing status in terms of its income levels for the life of the project. And that's something that is unique to a planned community zone, that the city can impose that as a restriction. If this was developed under existing zoning, the city would not be allowed to impose that that restriction. Um, the other comment I would make is of seniors who live in Palo Alto Housing Corporation projects around town, there's a Sheraton apartment that's of all seniors and other seniors. Um, almost 80%, 79% of our seniors who live in our, our, our residences now are actually over 70 years old. So we're finding that the age level is actually even higher than this 62 year requirement that would apply to this project. Thank you. Uh, the team um, against the measure, care to respond? The question again, how can it be guaranteed that only seniors will live in the proposed development, only Palo Alto seniors, only low-income seniors? Well, the history has been that uh, only a fraction of the seniors who live in the senior housing in Palo Alto actually were from Palo Alto. Uh, the Housing Corporation has said that it ranges from uh, 75% down to 60, 65%. It changes over time. And there is no way the city can enforce that only Palo Altans are occupants. Furthermore, uh, for those of you who are familiar with PC zoning, uh, there have been a number of cases over the years where the provisions that the developer put in for the PC were violated. And the city was informed and in the past 50 years, there has never been a case where there was any punishment, any fines, or any required correction. I'll give you two examples. Cafe Reyes and St. Michael's Alley, if you're familiar with those places, they both use what is supposed to be a public park as an outdoor dining area. And the staff and council have been told about it repeatedly, and they say, we aren't going to do anything about it. Not just two examples, I'll give you many more. So if the housing corporation decides that they want to convert that to lower uh, age people, or they want to change the uh, income levels, even though it violates the PC, the chances of there being any penalties are just about zilch. So they can tell you what they want to do, and they can make a commitment today, but two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you're gonna have a different housing corporation board, and they change it, that's the end of it. That's one of the problems with PCs. Second, uh, I can see instances where they don't have enough low-income seniors to fill the slots. And if you actually, if you go back to the census data, the number of seniors in Palo Alto that are, that are below uh, poverty level has gone down in the last couple of years as the economy has gone up and their income has gone up. So I wouldn't be surprised if three or four years from now, if the economy keeps getting better, there are even fewer low-income seniors. We have 681 low-income senior housing units in Palo Alto right now. And there are about, at the maximum, 580 low-income seniors. So most of the low-income seniors we have are already living in low-income housing. And I assume just one person per unit, and I think we have more than one person in those units. So the need for low-income senior housing is not as great as it has been represented. And in fact, again, if you look at the income levels, where well, they can range from a minimum of, say, 22 to 26,000 and up as high as 44 to 53,000, that's not what most people think of as really low income. So it's a problem that we don't really necessarily have. Thank you. The next question has to do with uh, the sidewalk 
that's being proposed. Uh, this, the team against the, the measure will respond first. It says the ordinance says that a sidewalk will be built up to El Camino on Maybell Avenue. Won't this require condemning property from private homeowners and cutting down trees? And I guess I would add, would there be sidewalks uh, if the zoning remains as it is? Ah, uh, yes. First of all, there is a sidewalk along Maybell. It goes all the way from uh, Climo up to El Camino on the opposite side of the street. Second, for those of you who are living in Barron Park, uh, when Barron Park annexed in 1975, a promise was made that the rural character of the neighborhood would be retained and there would be no widening of streets or installation of sidewalks, period. I still have the letter from the then mayor and I passed it around to people when I even sent a copy to the city council. So for the council or the housing corporation to say, we're gonna put in sidewalks before they've even talked to anybody in Barron Park is beyond insulting. Second, they're talking, in order to put sidewalks in, they're talking about taking people's front yard property. And staff is saying, oh, that makes takes eminent domain and eminent domain can be expensive. We can do it. There has never been an instance in Palo Alto where the city has used eminent domain, not in the last 35, 40 years that I'm aware of, to put in sidewalks or to widen streets. The city council adopted a policy years ago that under no circumstances would they widen any streets in Palo Alto. They might make some adjustments at corners and intersections, putting in bulb outs or making turn lanes, things like that. But streets will not be widened. And now the staff is talking about condemning land along Maybell to widen the streets and put in sidewalks. And they're talking about doing it without anybody at Barron Park, in Barron Park being asked or anybody being even formally notified. This is not the way we should be doing business. When we have a commitment made by the city, we shouldn't have the city and a private developer violating that commitment without notice, without discussion, without any concern for the community. That's not the way you run a city. I sure hope it's not. Thank you. Any more comments? I think you have a minute left. No, okay. Uh, then the team in favor of Measure D can respond regarding the uh, sidewalks. Yes, I, excuse me, I will um, comment on the, the aspect of it as it relates to the Housing Corporation's property on Maybell. We, we will be, there are no sidewalks there now from Climo down to the edge of this parcel. We will be paying to add a sidewalk there, and then again, these single-family homes will be set back from there. When you get further down towards El Camino, where it's not our property, that's really going to be the city's decision of how they want to um, proceed there. We're going to help with the funding of that if it's possible to do it, um, but I think Greg can answer how they would proceed with respect to properties that are not the Housing Corporation property. Thanks, Jane. So this is the first I've heard of. Um using eminent domain to condemn sidewalks. I, I'd say that's a fantasy line planned. Um, I'd say that's in the same category as Bob's other traffic numbers and that. I can just tell you unequivocally, Palo Alto will not be using eminent domain on any single family property ever. And the concept is just so out there that I, I'm surprised it actually got brought up. Um, so I can just tell you absolutely, there will never be any eminent domain on people's sidewalks. That's on their front of their properties. I, I'm just, sometimes you don't really know what to say, but that is not gonna happen. Don't have to worry about it. Thank you, I guess we'll change the subject now. Oh. All right, the next question is uh, to the team in favor. Uh, with only 47 parking spaces for 60 to 120 residents plus guests, relatives and service providers, would it not make sense to provide underground parking? And then they add the residents on Arastradero Park apartments already park on Maybell. How will you fix this? The 47 uh, parking space figure is the correct figure. There was a number mentioned earlier, uh, 42, but it is 47. 
and that's actually um, the highest parking ratio for a senior project that we can find. We have one of our own, Sheridan Apartments, that has 57 homes, so it is a few smaller than the 60 here, and the total spaces there are only 20, and we would acknowledge that 20 is not sufficient. In fact, we know we have eight residents there who would like to have a parking space if it was available. Um, the, the, we're going to be providing more than double the number of spaces here at Maybell than what exists in that situation. As far as Arrastadero Park, that is, um, I would acknowledge it is an issue. It was a building not built by us. It was built by a, a, a previous developer. We had the opportunity to uh, become the owner of it and keep it in affordable housing um, status which it would have not continued in. The parking problem is what it is. And we're hopeful that because this new site next door will actually have a way that the two properties are connected, that we can actually work together, because we will be the owners of both, to, to arrive at a, even a, a better parking solution that works, that improves that situation as well as covers the parking needs on this site. Thank you. Again, uh, the team opposed to Measure uh, D. Uh, talk, you addressed the issue of parking, uh, whether underground parking might be a solution or what about uh, problems with parking already? Three minutes. Your turn. The lack of parking and the parking proposed is just a symptom of this high density rezoning of neighborhoods. And this is being uh, brought to you by the same people that uh, recently have declared that the uh, problem with Palo Alto is traffic. When traffic is just a symptom of high excess, high density rezoning, we haven't stopped and taken care of the, of the problems. And we haven't taken a comprehensive view we keep wanting to make an expedient grab for uh, some, some housing that perhaps would um, please a bag. Well, I think that preservation of our neighborhoods is much more important than pleasing a bag. And you can't just talk about parking without talking about these, this massive rezoning of high density. Uh, projects into the neighborhood and I you know I, I'm at a loss on how to respond to the audacity of of this project that's put in, put in our face yeah in terms of parking the neighborhood asked for underground parking garages and thought that would be a better way of addressing the parking problem for those of you not familiar with the area, you know, we have the rest of parks, apartments, which include a lot of senior housing right next door. And they have one parking space per unit. This will have less, uh, less than that, about three quarters, pardon me, about 0.6 parking spaces. The rest of their park seniors have overflow parking and they fill up Climo. So if you have only six tenths of parking space for this project, that's going to cause overflow parking onto Maybell, Climo, Coulomb, all the streets around. And as you know, we've had a problem with overflow parking downtown North and Professorville for years, and they've been complaining about it and complaining about it and complaining about it. And finally, after years of allowing high density underparked projects to go in all over Palo Alto, guess what the city council said? We have a problem. We have a traffic and parking problem. We ought to address this. Wonderful. It's always nice to go out and try to fix something after it's all been created on your, on your watch. So since they recognize traffic and parking are a problem, why don't they recognize traffic and parking are a problem with the Maybell project? Because that's already been approved. They don't want to go back and look in the, in the past. Thank you. Next question is to your team. Again? Well, we, we're going back and <laughs> forth. It may seem like, yeah. 
Well, anyway, this question has to do with services available in the area and transportation. Uh, it points out there are no groceries in walking distance and how many seniors would be willing to live there without a vehicle. Would you like to comment on that? Okay, this, this area is a quarter mile from the, fir the first place where you can buy anything, that's Walgreens on El Camino. The nearest grocery store of any kind of groceries is Barron Park Market, which is about three quarters of a mile down. The real market, Safeway and Whole Foods, is about a mile and a quarter away. And uh, the what used to be the uh, San Antonio Center, which they've renamed, has a number of stores. And again, that's about a mile and a quarter away. So when we get predictions about how much the seniors going to be driving, they're going to be driving a lot more than just going to work because that's the only way they can shop. That's the only way they can get to a grocery store, a coffee shop. The nearest coffee shop is Starbucks. That's again about half a mile away. There, there just isn't anything with an easy walking distance and so the seniors are going to have cars and they're going to be driving. And Another thing that uh, people don't realize is there are a lot of events and programs for seniors. And I know people who take classes and programs at Coverly who are seniors. And those programs start at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. And so they're driving from Barron Park and Green Meadow and Green Acres up, May up Maybell and up Arastadero to get to Coverly. And the people who are going to be living in this project are going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be driving downtown to go to Avenidas. They're going to be uh, driving over to Midtown to use that shopping center. Seniors drive. That's how I got here. I didn't walk. So when you put seniors on a site and say they're not going to drive, you're not being realistic. They're going to drive. The question is how, how often, where, and what time of day. And that's going to vary. But there definitely are going to be people driving. Now one of the things they tell you is we're going, to, we're going to have a shuttle bus. But I asked them for details on the shuttle bus. Are they going to have a driver? Are they going to have regular routes? What time of day? Where are they going to go? Or is it just going to be something parked there that one of the seniors can take the key and go and drive it someplace when they want to? What kind of insurance system are they going to have? What kind of arrangements are they going to have if a senior wants to go downtown and another senior wants to go to Alma Plaza? So. I haven't seen any definitions of this, and I haven't seen any evidence that any of their other projects have real shuttle bus service. They'll talk about it, but asking for details, you get very little. Thank you. Uh, on on this, um, no, I'm trying to figure out where <laughs> I was. Uh, yes, this, this is the question again to you. The uh, <laughs> question is, uh, there is no, are no groceries in, within walking distance and how many seniors will be lo willing to live there without a vehicle? Three minutes. Yes. Thank you. Um, as Bob says, there is a Walgreens right down the street. It, it's, it is a Walgreens, but it does actually have groceries, amazingly. It's not like a supermarket, but there is, there is an opportunity there. As I mentioned in my comments earlier, there is one of the most frequent um, bus services that we have in the community, the Line 22 on El Camino. It runs, as I say, every 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. And I looked at the VTA schedule. If, if you were to take the bus, actually the way they, they marked this out, all the way down in Mountain View near Showers Drive, if you got on the bus there and took it all the way up to the University Avenue train station in Palo Alto, the length of time on their schedule that that takes is 20 minutes. So this is about halfway in between. So I would argue that there are lots of opportunities for seniors without cars to travel in, in a, you know, get on the bus and get off the bus exactly where you want to go. No transfers or any of the rest of that from this area to a wide range of services, including medical services. If they're uh, someone who has to go to the medical foundation or to the emergency, I mean, El Camino is really a transportation corridor that works, that works very, very well. Again, on the issue of are, are these very low-income seniors who have income potentially as low as $21,000, do they have cars? Our data from our projects is they, very few of them do, maybe 50% at most. 
And if you look at the, again, the parking that a variety of other senior housing uh, projects in the Palo Alto community provide, they don't provide one space for every unit on the basis that everybody has a car. The next highest, I think, to what we're providing, which is 0.7, is, let me see if I have it here. Um, well, Stevenson House is um, at 0.45 in terms of the number of parking spaces per resident. They would like some more for their visitors, they've told us, but in terms of the residents, that's a figure 54 parking spaces for 120 units. We're providing 47 parking spaces for 60 units. So we have very consciously recognized that we need to have that flexibility. We don't think they will all be used which will allow us to do a sharing arrangement with the Rastadero Park uh, property next door. And then finally, we do a lot of recreational, educational, and other transportation programs for our tenants in many of our properties around the community, including specifically the one right next door, Rastadero Park, where there is this van shuttle service, and that will be available to these seniors as well. Thank you. We have a mi another minute or so, no more. Okay. Then we'll move on to the next question. And for you this time. How and when was the city's loan to Palo Alto PACH made known and what are the terms? This is to the group in favor. So I'll just be briefly comment on the loan. The loan is not general fund money. In fact, there's a um, long history in Palo Alto of making loans um, to acquire land for affordable housing. This money does not come out of the general fund. It comes across money that's specifically set forth for low-income housing in our housing fund. So this doesn't impact you know, any services. People talk about it being taxpayer money that's being used for this. Yes, it's taxpayer money, but yes, it has been set aside purely for the purchase and supporting low-income housing. So that's all it can be used for. So I think that's the first point. The other thing, and I asked these questions when this came before the city council, because I could have easily voted against this project if I felt that it actually would impact the neighborhood in a worse way and that it wasn't a good senior affordable housing project. Without it coming before us, I would not be willing to pre-commit to this. And I've said this before. So I asked the city attorney on several occasions, okay, if we don't approve this project, what happens? Well, the answer is, is that it would get unwound and we would get our money back, simply put. And this is money that would have to go to affordable housing in any case. So the money would come back and then be used in some other capacity for an affordable housing project. And so that's at least my part of the answer to that. Gene, I don't know if you want to give the rest well, of Well, the only thing I would add to that is when, when Greg says these are, these, these are funds that become available because there is an affordable housing fee that the city collects from both commercial development, office type development, as well, well as market rate residential development. So there's a contribution that private market developers make when they build residential projects or commercial projects in the community to support affordable housing. So that's the source of the money. It's coming from developers contributed to the city and as Greg says, the city then has its, its only use can be to support affordable housing. And that's been, that was a revolutionary um, measure that Palo Alto's had in place since really the mid 1970s around the time the housing corporation was formed was the creation of that opportunity to either require affordable housing from residential development or collect a fee from other development to help support people who can build affordable housing. And I think I'd add to that that this is not unusual in other communities. There are actually court decisions that are clearly on point exactly that say this is perfectly acceptable, that you can do this, that it's you know, encouraged, that there's nothing underhanded about it, and that it doesn't impact the city council's decision in doing this. Thank you. The uh, team against Measure D. The question is how and when was the city's loan to PACH made known and what are the terms? Would you like to comment on that? It was clear that this was a done deal before uh, it was ever taken to the neighbors, ever taken to the, the general population of the city and then we're kind of reverse engineering and trying to create the look of a democratic process to back into a predetermined solution. And that's really wrong. Um, it's putting a, a square peg in a round hole. All these details really revolve around 
choosing an expedient path as opposed to us stepping back as a community and taking a look at what do we really want to accomplish in terms of senior housing? Where would it be best placed? But instead, we, we, we didn't do an RFP. Someone jumped on a piece of land. They uh, made a, a backroom deal for some loans, then brought it through the public and reverse an engineering, reverse engineered a democratic process to justify an end. So the, the conclusion was made long before the community was consulted. And that's not the Palo Alto that I want to participate in. Uh, you had put, push the button, sorry. I thought I did, I got it now. I'll just add the first time there was an actual uh, opening for the community to talk about this was May 9th when the housing subcommittee Council Housing Subcommittee met to discuss the project and among other things talk about how it met the ABAG requirements. And this is after they had had two meetings, first one November 19th last year and the second one March 4th this year to approve the loans. The loans were approved months before there was any formal presentation to the public and before there was any real opportunity for the public to get involved. So this was, as I said before, all a done deal, done under the table. The housing corporation had been looking at this land for years. They finally got the developer to sell it last June last year. And then they moved forward without the public knowing about it, let alone getting involved for months until they already had the and the approval basically in hand, since they had the money in hand. And once the council had made the commitment to give the housing corporation their money, that was the end of it. There's no way the public could have talked them out of it. And that became quite clear during the various council uh, hearings and, and meetings, that this was agreed to before there was any public information when the first real public meeting on this was held, the end of April, there was a mob. People couldn't get into the room, and they were furious. Thank you. Next question is to the team speaking against. What can you tell us about the scale of the project with the PC zoning that is being proposed to be built? As com is there a drawing that is available to people who are um, going to be asked to vote on this? Uh, perhaps you can address the difference in the projects. Is it your, is your turn? Question? Three minutes, yes. Uh, uh, the city put a drawing up on, on their website which shows the size of the senior building is about half the height it really is. And we did create a drawing using the city's drawing of the senior project plus the houses which were shown in the application that the housing corporation submitted and which the city staff submitted for discussion. Uh, they had about half a dozen different housing models which were very similar. They had slightly different uh, interior layouts but the basic appearance was quite similar. And so uh, we did put together a, a, uh, a layout using the computer so that you can get a fairly good idea of what it looks like. And one of the things that you have to recall is that the existing homes along Maybell, there are four homes, and they're on lots that are 65 to 85 feet wide. The new project, the homes are going to be on lots that are about 45 to 48 feet wide. So they're going to be much narrower than what's there now. There'll be seven instead of, five, instead of four. So you can do the math and figure out how much they have to shrink them. And they're going to be, well, let me put it this way. If you like the townhouses in Alma Plaza, you're going to love the houses they're proposing for this project because that's pretty much what they remind us all of. The only difference is they have, because the city council required it, they have a 10-foot setback. Alma Plaza, they're perhaps two or three feet. But outside of that, the appearance, if you look at the facade, is very similar. And that's not what the houses along Maybell look like. That's not what the houses in, in the neighborhood look like. So they're not compatible with the neighborhood appearance. They're not consistent. The overall project is inconsistent. 
we don't have any 50-foot buildings alongside of single-family homes anywhere in Barron Park. So this is not the type of project you normally see. I just wanted to add that the, the depictions that were originally put out for the project were simply deceptive in that they made uh, a single family home almost look larger than an apartment building and it was totally out of scale. And so these were the best marketing documents that uh, this objective city staff uh, was putting out. Thank you. I would like to comment that there was a member of the audience who was showing a depiction that is being displayed by the opponents to Measure D, and we have asked that it retain outside of the room because it is their perspective of what the development would look like, and I will ask the uh, group in favor of Measure D to uh, respond at this point. You have three minutes on this question of the uh, density. The, um, the senior housing building itself, as we've discussed before, is quite, is, it's gone through ARB review. There's quite a bit of specifics about exactly what that will be, the, the one that's going to be in the interior of the site. The single family homes on Maybell and Climo, we have not designed those. The city has specified what the design criteria will be. Again, I mentioned before, 20 foot setbacks from the street, that's, or from the sidewalk, that's similar to, that is what the R1 setback would be for front yards side yard setbacks, but separations between the buildings of, of 10 feet. Um, that's five feet and five feet, if you think about your own side yard, two-story um, height limitation, garages in the back accessed from interior of the site. You come off Climo into a driveway, you come in and you have two-car garages and, and driveways in the back, not out on the street frontage. I think a, an interesting um, comparable concept, and I'm not going to tell you it's exactly the same size, in fact I think if anything they're probably bigger, is the single family homes that were done over, you, they're right a couple blocks from here on Channing uh, when the medical foundation site was redeveloped. Now there's some multi-family buildings there, but there's also quite a bit of single family. Two stories with porches, in many cases the garages are in the back, sometimes there are driveways to the street, again this will not have any any driveways to the street. So that kind of, that's the, the nature of the character that I think a private home builder will pursue. Now they have to go back through the ARB and the ARB is gonna be looking at different uh, building types so there's not like a single massive style of building and variations in the setbacks so that it, again, it doesn't have a block, you know, single, single kind of frontage feel to it. And the same thing will be true on the smaller number of homes that are on Climo. Those are even further back onto the property because there are those wonderful, very mature oak trees right on the frontage and these need to be set back from that. So I think there's gonna be a lot of variation. We haven't designed it because it, that's not what that Palo Alto Housing Corporation does. We're specialists in affordable housing. And we're very, we will, when the time comes, we will seek proposals from home builders who build on these types of properties and see who seems to be the best one to proceed forward with that part of the project, subject to and required by the city to meet the conditions that the city council has imposed on these single family homes. Yeah, I just want to add that these are gonna look and feel like single family homes. And um, I know Bob likes to make inflammatory comments, but they're just not grounded in reality. I want to remind people again, if you go look at my house, it's on seal, it's a 50 foot wide lot. It feels like a single family home. Go look. To say that, you know, this is gonna look like the houses on Alma, it's just, just not true. I mean, you just, 48 feet looks like a single family home, especially when you don't have driveways. Thank you. We'll go to the next question, back again to the team in favor of Measure D. How does a change in zoning as was approved by the council provide affordable senior housing? How does that work? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Well, but well, let me change put, of zoning by itself does not provide affordable housing. Explain how that works. Right. Well, so the, what, the, what the planned community zone allows and allowed in this case is this combination of 60 one bedroom apartments in one building 
and 12 single family homes on the two frontages. The, the current zoning wouldn't allow that. So, I mean, you, you couldn't do the project that way under the current zoning. So what the PC zone allows is that type of flexibility of kind of different, different um, arrangements of the two different parts of it. Um, the other thing about the PC zone that's particularly critical for affordable housing is the city has the authority under its PC zoning ordinance to impose these affordability restrictions and make them a permanent part of this project approval. Uh, Bob chatted earlier about places where PC zones have not been followed. I do not know of a case where this, the housing corporation has ever attempted to convert affordable housing to non-affordable housing, and we would not be able to do under this zoning. And that, that does not exist under existing zoning, that ability to impose that very specific uh, restriction and guarantee and protection that these will be affordable senior housing. So that's why this PC concept, in fact, if you look around our community, Lytton Gardens, Stevenson House, many of the existing senior housing that you know of in the city, they were all accomplished through PC zones. That's how that these types of more dense senior housing and affordable housing projects have been accomplished in the community for the last 40 years. Thank you. Any more? Okay. You just briefly, I think it's also important, and I know Bob said a little bit earlier, that you could just build a 41-unit um, complex here of senior housing. That wouldn't work financially. The city council looked at that, thought about those issues. You couldn't get the tax credit financing. And, you know, I, I hesitate to go into all the details, frankly, because it's really complicated. But the housing corporation probably has the information available that it simply is not financially feasible to build a 41-unit um, senior housing on this site. If I have any more seconds left, I will comment that a major source of the success in achieving affordable housing is this tax credit program that exists. And it's a competitive process. We don't have the opportunity to just go in and say, we'd, we'd like some funding, you know, please award us some funding. We have to compete with other affordable housing projects. And what they look to is how essentially cost effective is what you're proposing to do for the funds you're seeking from them how many seniors or families, whatever is the category, are going to be able to be um, provided homes. And that's a very significant criteria in how they determine which projects really deserve a limited amount of, of taxpayer um, tax credit funding. And 60 units makes this very competitive. 40, we would not be competitive. We would not be able to achieve that tax credit funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, the, the uh, team in opposition to Measure D, would you like to comment on the fact that this proposal on the ballot relates to a zoning change? And does, what does that, how does that guarantee affordable senior housing? Well, there, there is a concept of uh, community benefits and community detriment. And, and what that does is that when you have a, a change in zoning, there's an increase in the value of the property, the rental in, income, and the marketability of the property. And that goes to the value of the project. Now, the detriments is the high density and, and the neighborhoods pay the price. In fact, we all pay the price. I was sitting on 101 um, in a commute lane, parked, and I hadn't realized how dense and how different our community is uh, over the last couple of years compared to when I had moved here 30 years ago. And that's just a steamroller that's coming, coming at us. But in terms of this mechanism of the rezoning, if it was all being rezoned for the benefit of senior housing, that would be wonderful. But when only one acre is being dedicated to senior housing, and the other acre and a half is all about private property and private development profits, that's unacceptable. And you're giving a gift to a developer and asking the neighborhood and the whole community to pay the price, and that's wrong. That's, that's heartbreaking. You still have time, yes. Uh, just to continue on, on that, if what gets built in Palo Alto depends on how outside funding wants to pay, then we're completely at a, at a, at a loss to control our own destiny. Now, 
I've been told by the Housing Corporation repeatedly that if they went in for only 41 units, they couldn't compete with the other uh, low-income housing uh, uh, proponents. And what this tells me is that the whole process is skewed, that it's looking towards where the money is, it's looking towards who is providing the money, it's not looking at all at how it fits in the community, what's good for the neighborhood, outside problems like traffic, parking, safety, all of those are secondary or tertiary. So again, we're being told that zoning in Palo Alto is a matter of who brings the bucks. And I don't think that's the way zoning should be done in Palo Alto or any place else. I think we should be looking first of all at the environment, at what we want to have the city look like, how we want it to function, safety, and property values for the adjacent neighbors. That's what's important. Thank you. The next question is to uh, the team opposed to Measure D. Would low-income homes lower the value of surrounding single-family homes? No. There are already four low-income housing projects in this neighborhood. So the fact of uh, the, the idea of putting affordable housing into the neighborhood is not even a factor in the, being for or against Measure D. Um, the uh, neighborhood has embraced affordable housing. It does not embrace high density rezoning of neighborhoods and auctioning off our quality of life. You know, Palo Alto is n not a commodity to be auctioned off. It is a community to be treasured. And uh, I hope that everyone in the audience can cut through and see that we're going down a path that is taking us to a future that does not look very good. We have to stop and then get together and, and address these needs that we all share. We all share in the compassion for, for seniors. And we sh all share in the compassion for uh, affordable senior house, uh, affordable housing. We have the hearts to do this, but we're doing it wrong and we're dictating and harm onto the neighborhoods. Speaking as a member of the Terman Working Group, I was one of the people that supported low-income housing at the Terman site, which we have now. It also, I think some of you are familiar with the Buena Vista trailer park issue, 35 years ago, I got the city council to zone that to the lowest possible multifamily density. Staff wanted to zone with RM30 or RM20, and I got the council to go to with RM10. The idea being that the lower the density, the less impulse there would be to sell and redevelop. And that's worked. And I've asked the council once again to assure both Chisser, the owner of the property, and the people who want to buy it, that it will not be developed at higher than RM15 and take a lot of the pressure off losing that site. Thank you. Uh, would you like to comment, uh, the team in favor of Measure D, would low-income homes lower the value of surrounding single-family homes? This is one thing where Tim Gray and I both agree. Absolutely not. It will not have that impact. Where we don't agree is that, again, that you can accomplish the very low-income goal that this project is seeking uh, to achieve with the lower density that he argues is, is feasible. It simply is not feasible. Um, and again, these, the, the density of this proposal is absolutely in common with all of the other senior housing projects that you think of when you look around the community. So year in, year out, this kind of density is what makes these projects affordable and makes them able to be financed and provided to the community. I just think it's important to remember that this project creates less impact on the neighborhood. Over and over again, this is the defining feature of this project. This is a win-win for the neighborhood. You have less impacts, less traffic, less density, less people. All of that is positive for the neighborhood. This is, in effect, a down zoning, not an up zoning. 
That's what this is. At the end of the day, the neighborhood will feel like a single family neighborhood. There will be less traffic on the streets, less issues that people talk about, that they're concerned about. This will be better for the community in terms of just the feel and look of it. And as a bonus, we also get the senior housing, which at least Mr. Gray says we need. Mr. Moss, I, I thought I heard him say that he thought this would be more expensive for the city. And that would be a reason not to have senior housing is that it would cost the city, I don't know what he said, 2,500 or something per unit. Uh, that, you know, we need this housing and it's a win-win. And I think when the opponents continually say that the neighborhood's gonna bear the brunt of this, the existing zoning will create more traffic, will create more impacts, will create impacts on our schools, traffic, safety concerns, all of that. All you need to do is look at the trip data. You know, it's not rocket science. Go look at the trip data on the website and you will see that there are less trips created by this project, especially in the AM peak period, which is when you look, go out to Clemo and Maybell, most of the time out there, it is quiet. Traffic is not an issue. There is that morning AM when you have the bike commute, the kids are getting to school, and yes, it's a zoo out there. But this project will create less impact on that traffic. And I think it's important to keep remembering that this will create less impacts, it will be better for the neighborhood, and we get the senior affordable housing. It's hard to imagine why you wouldn't actually vote for this project. Thank you. Next question comes back to the team in favor. Uh, this question is, would PAHC be willing to close car access to Maybell so that it can be bike, pedestrian, safe street? Thus, all vehicle access would be onto Arastradero or Clima. Well, I think the, um, the, again, the traffic analysis looked at where the, the trips would go. It didn't, it, it found as a significantly positive aspect of this, the fact that there won't be a driveway curb cut access onto Maybell from the single family homes. The way a car from this pro property could get out to Maybell would be from interior to the site, they would move uh, with an access easement, which we will be providing over to the Arasadero Park property and then that trip would or that person in a vehicle would cho could either choose to go out to Rastradero from there or out to Maybell and then depending on where they were headed they could you know they would go to El Camino or they go to Maybell would depend on what the what the trip was and obviously also there's access out onto Clemo and on Clemo over to Rastradero so the main directions of where the trips will would come from the site will be towards Rastradero from Clemo or through the Arasadero Park neighboring site and some number of trips. And I think the traffic study looked at that as a, in the morning, as I recall, they said there would be a total of nine additional trips in the p period that, that Greg is referring to from the senior and the, the, the single family housing, nine additional above what you have there today with the four homes. And that those would be distributed out to the street pattern with only some of them uh, actually using Maybell. Thank you, and the team opposed. Would a closing uh, car access uh, make a difference in your uh, point of view on this? Oh, it's my understanding that the language is that if possible, and they, there has to be some, uh, I'm not sure if it's eminent domain, but taking from a, uh, another uh, neighborhood, uh, some parking places to be able to, to get the egress, that's not correct? No. Okay. No, we, we do have, we, since we own the property next door, we do need to ha create an access easement, but that's already been, you know, verified that we can do that. Okay, so, okay. so we, it's, it's the same. There, there is a parking being taken, and then they said if feasible, so I guess that's, that uh, is feasible. Uh, this has to do with closing off uh, car access to Maybell. Yeah, the, one of the conditions that the staff put on it was that they should have access onto Maybell, not just onto Clemo, and that they had to get it through the adjacent parking lot, which they did. And what that means is that anybody on the site who wants to go to El Camino during rush hour is going to take that parking lot 
access because it's impossible to make a left turn from Klimo onto Arrestadero during rush hour. The traffic is just too intense. So that's going to add traffic to Maybell. Now it's going in the opposite direction from the way the school traffic is going, but it's still adding traffic. And when the kids come down on the bikes, they don't pay attention to which side of the street they're on. So it is going to have some impacts. And of course, it's not just the people from the single family homes, it's going to be people from the senior project also who want to go up to El Camino. Second, because there's a stoplight at Maybell and El Camino, it makes it much easier for people to get onto El Camino from the project if that's where they wanted to go. If there was no stoplight, then I could say, yeah, you had a problem like you do on Climo. On Climo, you don't have a stoplight. It's impossible, well, almost impossible to put a stoplight at Climo next to Kulo. There are a couple places in the city where that's been done, but the traffic department hates it. So once you have the ability for people to take the parking lot route onto Maybell, they're going to do it. And I think it's just a matter of time before people that want to go from the site down to the research park during rush hour will be taking Maybell also because they'll be having problems. Traffic gets backed up at the stoplight at Coulomb and they won't be able to make right turns from Climo onto Arrastadero. So they'll swing around and try to sneak in on, on Maybell and that'll increase Maybell traffic. How much? We won't know unless and until the project is built, but I'm sure it'll be noticeable and it'll be significant. And that's one of the reasons we're concerned about traffic and safety. And these, uh, these details are kind of symptomatic of trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. There is probably other city land that would be much more suitable. And this is really the wrong location, and it may be the right project, but it's expedient, it's not comprehensive in thinking, it's not inclusive of the community, it's not democratic. Okay, thank you. Now, for the opponents, um, this is the question, the next question for you. This will be our last question before we have closing remarks. Uh, for the uh, team that is opposed to Measure D, please be specific about what you want to do with the site, the number of units, price, traffic, et cetera. If Measure D fails, will the existing zoning create single family homes or condominiums? Well, one thing we do know about the loan from the city is that the city now controls the destiny of that property. So with, with the provisions of that, I see Mark Bourbon out there uh, acting out, but um, <laughs> This is the, the fact. The city has, within its loan agreement, the, the ability to control the future of this property. And if there was a destructive future, it would be only with the city's permission. And Greg, I'm sure that the council would never hand the neighborhood a negative result. Uh, since the city has the right to take the property over due to the $7.3 million loan, uh, assuming the project is defeated and the city takes it back, they could do something almost unprecedented in Palo Alto. They could have it developed under the existing zoning, not have a PC, not increase the density, not try to shove something in that doesn't fit. When the zoning was put in, 75 years ago, we had a pretty good idea of what we wanted. We wanted to have a low density transition from the R1 to the high density along Arrastadero, and that's what RM15 does. We wanted to make the potential impact on traffic, on schools, on the neighborhood as low as possible. That's what RM15 does. We thought the four single family homes that were there since the 1950s were fine, and that's what the facade along Maybell could look like. You could, of course, replace them with bigger homes, I think one of them is only 900 square feet, but it would still be a single family neighborhood adjacent, across the street from single family homes. That would be fine. Anybody wanted to build it that way? Wonderful. On the other hand, if the city wanted to try to make more money, they could sell it to a developer who would put in single family homes on the RM15 site. And you could do that. But if you do the math, you have to have a 6,000 square foot lot 
for a single family home, and if you include the driveway, the maximum number of houses you can put on that site is 15. So 15, the maximum number of car trips per day is 150, and that's the maximum. And that would also be less traffic during school hours, during the rush hour in the morning and the rush hour in the evening. So if they wanted to redevelop that as purely single family, and by the way, that's where a developer would make the most money, wonderful. We don't complain about that. But what the city would, would like to do, I hope, if they take it over, is to build something within the existing zoning, and that's been our goal from day one. If they do that, we're all happy. And take the money and go to another site. Thank you. Uh, for the team in favor of Measure D, what, what is your view about what the site would be without the change in zoning? Well, Tim, I appreciate the, the confidence, and yes, I would do everything I could to protect the neighborhood, but we as a city don't control the site. We have basically $5 million as a loan on a piece of property that was paid $16 million for. So it's $16 million was the purchase price. If this doesn't go forward, the Palo Alto Housing Corporation is going to sell the site. They are going to sell it to a market rate developer who is most likely going to build 46 units. It's most likely what they're going to do. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. It will be a combination, most likely, of single family, um, small lot single family. It's the row houses that uh, Bob Moss rails against. That's most likely what you'd get. Plus, you would get some high density condos or apartments. I believe they'd probably be condos, frankly, because I think the market for condos is better. And that's what you'd end up with. You'd end up with a portion of high density that's not a single family feel, and those probably small lot single family that people hate so much with the 30 narrow foot lots and that kind of stuff, and that's what you're gonna end up with. And, you know, it's gonna be unfortunate. I could add to that. I mean, it, that is not a scenario that we want to have happen for obvious reasons, as you've heard today. Um, but if it did occur that we were not able to proceed and we do need to sell it to basically re recover um, the investment and repay, not just the city loan, we have other loans um, that we would be repaying out of a sales proceed. So the city would get its funds back, but it would then be in the hands of a, a private owner um, who, you know, could have purchased it when we purchased it, but they, they, nobody, we were successful. But that's where it would go, and um, we don't want that result. I think, personally, it feels, Greg was talking about a win-win. I think that would be a lose-lose outcome that if you are not able to go forward and accomplish this, the benefit of this senior housing in the community and the property and instead goes over into the development um, approach of a private developer whose goal is to maximize their financial success, I think that would be a really unfortunate outcome for the city. And I agree with that. It would be a most unfortunate outcome. Thank you. Now we will proceed uh, to the closing statements by each side. And in accordance with our rotation, we will allow the team who is against Measure D to make the first closing statement. It will be five minutes. Gentlemen, five minutes. The uh, proponents of the rezoning want you to think that Measure D is all about senior housing. It's not. It's about the out-of-control development we've been having in Palo Alto and how PC zoning is out of control. There's no reason we can't build senior housing within the existing zoning. It's perfectly legal. The only excuse we've been given is money. And I don't think that that's what we should be worrying about. I don't think we should be allowing our zoning to be sold. Because we're worried about what the overall site is going to look like, taken as a, as a unit, uh, it's possible to build senior housing on the site, a combination of senior housing and market rate single family housing, or with the existing zoning, single family homes and, and apartments. But whatever is built should be consistent with the neighborhood, should pay attention to what the community has said they want. And believe me, the community has been very vocal about what they want and don't want. And it should be appropriate in size, in scale, setbacks, appearance. We want something that fits in the community. 
claims that the existing zoning would allow greater density or greater traffic are just false because they're using incorrect models for traffic and senior housing. And as I said, we've looked at what the traffic from the senior housing really would be versus what they think it's going to be and would not be significantly lower because 60 units is more than 30 or 32 units and the difference between the number of trips per day from apartments and senior units is far less than they're claiming. We would have higher density, we'd worsen the traffic gridlock, we'd make traffic safety, especially for students going to and from school, worse, and we would really hurt the ambience of the community. If what we're interested in is zoning for the highest bidder, that's what this project offers. If what we're interested in keeping Palo Alto a great safe place to live, including for seniors and students and the neighbors, and tell the city council to protect neighborhoods first, worry about the neighborhood and consistency of land use and zoning first, defeat this project so that we can come in with something that meets both the comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, rational development, and the needs and wants of the neighborhoods. We can still build some new housing here or elsewhere in town and, and satisfy whatever needs there are without undoing community integration, coherence, and appearance. Making Palo Alto a better city, not a sick one. Vote against Measure D. Please see clearly that Measure D is about much more than one project on Mabel. It's the tip of the iceberg. Yes, there will be high price spin doctors, in fact, $104,000 worth if you read the newspaper this morning, that will point to a worthy cause to justify each little or harmless exception. Our quality of life is not for sale. If Measure D is not stopped, the lot next to you will become a high density PC zone for the next stated worthy cause. An additional observation is that Measure D high density rezoning of residential neighborhoods is being promoted by the same people that say that traffic is the problem when traffic is just a, the real uh, a symptom and the real problem is density. Then the city tries to cram 60 housing units on land of, of suitable for 41 because the re real suitable land near transit and service quarters is needed for office complexes. Then those office complexes are built and those jobs then jack up the imbalance and compels the city to cram more density into neighborhoods to cure the jobs to housing imbalance. It turns into an urban spiral that goes out of control and transforms into a tornado of development that leaves a path of destruction and takes away our quality of life. Stopping Measure D is essential if we want to take the first step in stopping this destructive storm that will only gain velocity. Thank you. Five minutes. So once again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters in Palo Alto for organizing and hosting this important voter education event. And I'd like to thank Bob Moss and Tim Gray for an engaging and spirited debate. Um, and in closing, I wanted to reiterate a few important points about the why the community should vote yes on Measure D. The Maybell Affordable Senior Housing Project will fill a critical need in our community for senior affordable housing. I don't think anyone disagreed with that today. Um, as we said earlier, nearly 20% of Palo Alto seniors are living near or below the poverty line. The 60 affordable senior units to be built for this project will provide needed housing for those seniors who want to remain in the community where they have lived or worked for many years. This is about this project, and that's what you're voting on. Do you want this particular project? What um, Tim just said I thought was all over the top. No one's going to come and put a PC zone next to your house. It's not going to happen. It's way over the top. In fact, when I've been on the council, we've had two PC zones that we've approved. Two. This is not PC zones everywhere. Simply two. This one and the one at Lytton, which people referred to as the gateway building. Those are the only two we've approved. 
you know, PC zones aren't springing up in your local neighborhood. I think people need to realize that. So Measure D will guarantee that this project will remain senior housing indefinitely. And that's what the PC zone did with this. In fact, I remember Mr. Moss coming to council and saying that we should approach this project not with a PC zone, because he dislikes PC zones, but we should zone it RM30, and he actually, RM40. He actually came to council and suggested we zone this, upzone this RM40, and that was his argument to us. So things change, I guess. Um, now this project, we've heard a lot of claims, and you know, we have traffic engineers in the city of Palo Alto. We hire them, you can read their reports. You can't believe unsubstantiated claims that the traffic's wrong, reports are wrong. You know, it, the world devolves into madness if you say to yourself, the city's data is wrong. We all need to agree on the data, and we have correct data. Mr. Moss has not got correct data. Um, the other thing we really have to think about this is what is the alternative to this? The alternative is the current zoning. The city council has no discretion over current zoning. You know, it comes to you, it doesn't even come to the city council. It goes through the ARB process, it gets approved. One of the nice things about a PC zoning process, frankly, on something like this, is that we could address the individual neighborhood concerns, which I believe we did. And I believe we did it thoughtfully and carefully here. And you know, I think we need to basically get a sense of on controversial land use decisions, the city council almost never votes unanimously because there are different points of view. On this project, there was one point of view from the most ardent, what we could term residentialists on the council to the most pro-development council members. Everybody agreed this was the right project for the city. You know, it was unanimous. And I am confident the city council made the right decision. I'm 100% confident on that. And I believe the community will stand behind this project and vote yes, because it is a win-win. There are less impacts on our school, less impacts on the community. And we get needed affordable senior housing, which is a positive for this community. And I believe everyone in Palo Alto thinks that's a positive. You know, again, it will preserve the look and feel of the single family neighborhood. The 12 single family homes proposed with the project will provide a buffer and transition between the existing single family neighborhoods. So I just wanna say, I would encourage everyone to become more informed and I would encourage the weekly to go ahead and look at the facts of this. Look at the traffic studies, you know, put it out there for the community because it's really important to have a real debate to have the basic facts in agreement. The city on its website has a frequently asked questions about Maybell. Look at that. Also go to the Measure D campaign site, www.yesondpaloalto.com to become more informed. So on behalf of myself, Gene McCown, the Palo Alto Housing Corporations, and the hundreds of Measure D supporters and seniors who need a safe, affordable home, I urge you to vote yes on Measure D on or before November 5th, 2013. Let's give a big hand to our speakers. <laughs> and thanks again to our volunteers who helped uh, with th this debate today and made it success. Finally, uh, it's back to Mary Ellis from the League. Thank you, Linda. Um, first, I want to thank Linda for being our moderator for this event. Thank you. I want to thank all four of our speakers for participating in a lively discussion to assist voters when they make their decision on November 5th. A special thanks to Veronica Tincher for putting so much time into presenting this event, and also to our timekeeper, Shirley, for keeping us on time.
I want to thank our question sorters, Crowney Billick from the Los Altos Mountain View League and Elaine Hope from the South San Mateo County League. And a very special thanks to the Youth Community Service teens who helped us with the question gathering. At, <laughs> Alexandra, Elaine, Conrad, and Brian, all from Gunn High School. A big thank you to the city of Palo Alto Manager's Office for allowing us to use the council chambers. All of you who were, all of you were great in making the deba debate work. Finally, a big thank you to the Media Center for all the work of bringing this debate to the air. Don't forget smartvoter.org for more information. And, don't, and really don't forget to vote on November 5th. And stop at the league table in the back of the room to pick up more election information at our table. Now please join the speakers for conversation and good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.